in our headlines on this Monday afternoon, July 25th. Starting on this Monday, all those entering South Korea are required to take PCR tests upon arrival amid the rebounding COVID-19 caseloads and related efforts to better address it. Parliamentary hearings are taking place starting today for three days, with officials under the UN administration to take questions on politics, diplomacy, security and the economy. South Korea's exports to China have been retreating, while those to the US have been rising during the first half of this year. And it's a link to the trend of Beijing's prolonged zero-COVID policy. There has been a decline in COVID-19 caseloads in light of the weekend factor. Authorities on this Monday announced 35,883 new infections over the past 24 hours. Now, in line with efforts to better respond to the latest rebound, those entering South Korea will be required to take a PCR test upon arrival, while in-person visits to nursing facilities have been restricted. Our parent just starts off. Starting Monday, all those arriving in South Korea will have to take a PCR test on the day they arrive, as part of the government's efforts to prevent the further spread of the virus during summer vacation season. South Korean citizens and long-term travelers will be able to take the test for free at their local public health centers. Those staying in the country for a short period of time are advised to take the test at the testing center located inside the airport. Those who test positive must quarantine for seven days. The rules for overseas arrivals had been eased last month, giving them up to three days to take the PCR test. But this has been tightened again as the country deals with another wave of the virus. Since late June, the BA5 variant, now dominant, has been spreading quickly. Also starting Monday, tighter rules will be in place for nursing homes. Visitors will not be allowed to make physical contact with nursing home residents and will only be able to meet with them through a glass window. Workers in these facilities will need to take a PCR test once a week if three months have not passed since they received their fourth vaccine dose, or if they have contracted COVID-19 in the past 45 days. The new stricter measures come as the country sees a rise in number of cases among people who are fully vaccinated and boosted. Hyun's Arirang News. And health authorities here in South Korea this week will be taking measures in response to Saturday's declaration of monkeypox as a public health emergency of international concern by the World Health Organization. Our engine tells us what this means. South Korea's government is aiming to tame monkeypox concerns. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency are set to discuss monkeypox prevention measures this week following a decision by the WHO to declare the disease a public health emergency of international concern, the highest level of alert the organization can issue. The country's health authorities said on Sunday that the meeting will be more focused on reassessing current monkeypox countermeasures rather than unveiling new rules. The exact date of the meeting has not been confirmed. In June, South Korean health authorities designated monkeypox a Tier 2 infectious disease, meaning that it requires anyone infected to be reported and placed in quarantine. There are 22 diseases in total in this category, including COVID-19. After the first infection was confirmed in the country on June 22nd, health officials issued a caution-level alert and organized a 24-hour emergency monitoring system for monkeypox, while encouraging local authorities to install a task force if and when infections are found in their area. The government also rolled out a second-generation vaccination program for medical staff at the National Medical Center and designated 27 countries as quarantine inspection-required areas. The first confirmed case of monkeypox in the country was a Korean traveler from Germany who underwent isolation treatment at Incheon Medical Center for 15 days. The person was released from quarantine earlier this month, while no other infections have been confirmed in the country. Meanwhile, 504 doses of the monkeypox treatment were distributed to 17 major hospitals across the nation on July 8th. The authorities are also working on an agreement to secure third-generation monkeypox vaccines for 5,000 people. Ian Jin, Arirang News. 
Meanwhile, on the local political front, parliamentary hearings are taking place with officials under the UN administration taking questions on politics, diplomacy and security on this Monday. Now on the table today is the probe into the killing of a South Korean fisheries official by the North Korean military back in the year 2020, as well as investigations into the forced return of North Korean fishermen back in the year 2019, and the newly established Police Supervisory Bureau under the Interior Ministry. Meanwhile, the three-day Q&A session also marks the first for Prime Minister Han Dok Su to be grilled by lawmakers since taking office. Now, come tomorrow, government authorities will face questions on the economy and on Wednesday, the society. Findings show South Korea's exports to neighboring China have been retreating, while those to the U.S. have been rising. Now, insiders are largely linking these findings to Beijing's ongoing zero-COVID strategy. Our Easting Day reports. Recent data from the Korea International Trade Association shows South Korea's exports to China are declining, while its exports to the U.S. are on the rise. In the first half of 2022, China's share of South Korea's total exports was at 23.1 percent, while the U.S. took up a 15.7 percent. For China, it was down from 25.1 percent in the first half of 2021, while for the U.S., it was up from the 15.3 percent from the same period. Moreover, the share of exports to the U.S. has been consistently growing each year. Experts cited a number of reasons for why South Korea's exports to China have been on the decline. The prolonged COVID-19 lockdown measures in China have been slowing down products from coming into the country. But some experts say that China has also seen an improvement in its manufacturing technology, leading to more domestic production. South Korea is also seeing its trade deficit with China increasing. South Korea's trade balance showed a 1.1 billion U.S. dollar deficit for May and a $1.2 billion trade deficit for June. From July 1st to the 20th, the trade deficit is $1.5 billion. Meanwhile, South Korea's export figures to the U.S. have been rising over the years. Experts say the U.S.-China trade war that started in 2018 means the U.S. is buying more South Korean goods as opposed to Chinese goods. But also, with South Korean firms investing heavily into R&D, observers say the U.S. could continue to seek out South Korean goods in hopes of countering the effects of its prolonged trade war with China. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Over in the U.S., Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen believes the American economy is slowing but not in recession, given the country's strong employment numbers and consumption. Speaking on NBC's Meet the Press this past Sunday, Yellen underscored the monthly average job gains in the U.S. that stood at around 375,000 over the past three months, which reportedly imply the economy is transitioning into slow growth and not receding. She also highlighted the importance of rate hikes in addressing runaway inflation and spoke of hopes for a solution to sustain the labor market and stem inflation. Meanwhile, a sad milestone this past Sunday. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is entering its sixth month and assaults against civilians and infrastructure persist. Our Kim hyo has this coverage. Attacks on key Ukrainian infrastructure continued on the 105th day of Russia's war against its neighbor. Moscow's missiles hit Ukraine's Black Sea port of Odessa on Saturday, just hours after the two countries signed agreements to allow grain exports to resume. Russian attacks continue across the country, with Moscow announcing earlier last week that its military objectives in Ukraine would now go beyond the eastern Donbas region, marking the clearest acknowledgement that the country has expanded its war goals. The U.N. estimates that some 5,000 civilians have lost their lives in Ukraine during the five months since the onset of Russia's invasion. While the actual casualty figure could be even higher than that, Ukraine's health ministry says at least 18 medical personnel had been killed and nearly 900 medical facilities had been damaged or destroyed so far. With the war entering its sixth month on Sunday, Ukrainian president vowed that his country would do all it can to fight against Russia. So we don't let up. As in every day during the last five months, we do everything to inflict the highest possible damage on the enemy and to gather for Ukraine as much support as possible. 
Against his backdrop, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov dismissed claims that Moscow was the cause of the global food crisis. Visiting Egypt, he stressed that it was Western nations who were distorting the truth about the impact of sanctions on global food security. He further elaborated that the West, including the U.S., Britain, and Germany, as well as many EU and NATO member states, was prolonging the conflict. Lavrov added that while Moscow stands ready to resume negotiations with Ukraine on a number of issues, Ukraine and the West have not agreed to return to the negotiating table. Kim Hye-san, Arirang News. Meanwhile, on the entertainment front, K-pop girl group Itchy has hit number eight on the U.S. Billboard 200 album chart with its new album Checkmate. Now, Billboard says the seven-track album sold 33,000 units. Checkmate is its third time on the chart, following its 2021 albums Guess Who and Crazy in Love. It is also the group's highest ranking thus far and makes it only the fourth K-pop girl group to enter the top 10 of the Billboard 200, following Blackpink, Twice and Espa. Lore Olympus is an online comic. It was published by South Korean IT giant Neva and has garnered one of the industry's highest honors. The comic created by Rachel Smith and released on Neva's Webtoon platform took the best webcom prize at the Will Eisner Comic Industry Awards at the San Diego Comic Con. The announcement came on Sunday and marks the first time a vertical strolling work has won. Lore Olympus is a modern retelling of the lives and loves of Greek gods. Neneva has been publishing these stories since the year 2018 and it's available free of charge on Neighbours Webtoon page. Right, and that ends the first half of the Daily Report. In the second half, we address Europe's claims of blackmail by Russia with regard to energy. Stay with us. South Korea's experience in Hakon COVID-19 and introduced a Korean media. A Korean survivor of Japan's wartime sex slavery met with... Extraordinary Pope. climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. The objective of its North Korea policy is... Protests is gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters?
Welcome back. Russia plays a pivotal part in Europe's energy supplies as it provides the continent with 45% of its natural gas, 45% of its coal and 25% of its oil. Accordingly, pundits say the Kremlin is weaponizing energy to discourage Europe's support of Ukraine. For more on this, I have Professor Shin sang from Kyung University here in the studio. Professor Shin, welcome back. My pleasure. I also have Professor Sebastian Harold at the Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences over in Germany, live on the line. Professor Harold, it's a pleasure. I'm pleased to be here. Right, Professor Shin, we'll start mm -hmm. here in the studio then. Let's start with a few words on Europe's dependence on Russian mm -hmm. energy prior to, that is, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Well, in a world, the European Union is heavily relying on the energies coming from Russia. Uh, if I give you some more details, uh, Russia supplies about 40% of natural gas, I mean European Union's natural gas, and 25 or 26% of the uh, oil imported from the Russia. Uh, so the European Union uh, a year sends uh, roughly uh, about 400 billion euros uh, in return. And they, so uh, the European Union member countries uh, seem to make every effort to reduce its dependence on the Russian. Uh, so last May, they announced a uh, plan named the Repower European Union. According to this, uh, uh, the plan, the European Union plans to reduce its dependence on the uh, Russia, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, its Russian energies. At the same time, they want to uh, speed it up its shift to green energy. And the, uh, so uh, by the year 2013, uh, 30, sorry, the European Union plans to reduce the natural gas consumption by 30%. As a whole energy consumption, they want to reduce by 13%. At the same time, the European Union wants to increase uh, the uh, European Union's renewable energy or green energy up to 45%. Right, I see. Mm -hmm. And Professor Harold, following 10 days of maintenance work, natural gas from Russia is flowing back into Germany where you are via the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Now I understand it's uh, flowing at 40% capacity, which is more or less what it had been before the maintenance halt. Now what are the broader implications of this perhaps reduction in supply, Professor Harold? The fact that Nord Stream 1 is operating at only 40% of its capacity and uh, flows on other pipeline routes from Russia are being reduced or have stopped altogether means a very tight market with high prices. That means challenges for industry and households, especially poorer households. And it meets existential problems for gas importing companies, which must compensate for Russian shortfalls by buying from alternative sources at much higher prices. The German government just bailed out the largest gas trader, Uniper, with a 15 billion euro package. But Nord Stream 1 at 40% might just be enough to get through the winter without artificially restricting gas deliveries to customers, at least if the winter is not too severe. The point is, Russia could reduce the flow any time to 20% or even to zero, and uh, then Germany and Europe would face more serious supply problems, which could result in shutdowns of industrial sites or universities staying cold. So, in addition to a tight market and high prices, Russian behavior is creating an atmosphere of uncertainty and fear in which contracts no longer count. The flows can change every day, depending solely on the Kremlin's mood. Right, and staying with that, Professor Shin, mm -hmm. how is perhaps the escalating cost of natural gas affecting other countries, including South Korea? Well, it will affect um, uh, quite di differently, I mean, depending on uh, which nation they are. Uh, in case of Korea, well, before I mentioning, explain about the Korean situation, as you know very well, international oil prices rose 61 percent, roughly, and the LNG spot prices uh, jumped uh, 141 percent uh, uh, for, earlier, for a year earlier. I thought uh, it, it, it increased uh, dramatically. Uh, so in some sense, the hikes of the uh, natural gas prices is in inevitable. Uh, as global oil and natural gas prices uh, soared. 
uh, uh, particularly on the part of the Korean economy, the Korean currency value one has been weakened dramatically. Uh, I mean, against the USA dollar. So because of these two reasons, uh, the uh, uh, the natural gas prices increase uh, very much for the last one year in Korea. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, last. Uh, J uh, July 1st, there was a third hike of the natural gas prices in Korea. The first one was done in uh, April, second one was done in uh, May, uh, in, and the third one, the July the 1st. From the July the 1st, the government increased the natural gas prices by 7 up to 7.7 percent. I think it's inevitable, uh, as I said before. Uh, but the, uh, one thing is quite important, that is that the uh, the Korean, uh, the LNG uh, purchases are less affected uh, by soaring spot uh, prices of natural gas prices because that the uh, roughly 80% of the Korean, uh, I mean, LNG purchasing contract are based on long-term contract. Uh, so there, there are the, some uh, the price limits in, in the importing uh, the natural gas prices. That means they are less affected by the soaring spot price, uh, the uh, prices of natural market in the mar I mean, in in the uh, the global market. Right, I see. Professor Harold, back to Europe then. Against this dire background, Russia and Iran have signed a 40 billion US dollar deal for future gas and oil. Projects. What do you suppose is the significance of this energy deal between uh, these two countries, given the current state of global affairs? It, it is a political signal that the two countries with the largest natural gas reserves in the world and also with huge oil reserves are standing together. It is a signal above all to the developing countries to think carefully about whether they want to follow Europe's and the US attempt to isolate Russia for years. At the same time, it shows how difficult it is for Russia to get real support when President Putin has to travel to isolated Tehran for a kind word. Two isolated countries helping each other may make sense in some ways, but uh, such assistance is also limited. Gazprom will suffer from sanctions, so it is not exactly the best partner to help Iranian oil and gas production. Moreover, both are competing for the same limited market to sell oil and gas to that part of the world that still accepts energy from these two outsider countries, which comes with price discounts. Much will depend on whether or not and to what extent large customers like China and India will be part of this limited market. Right. And Professor Shin, back with regard to natural gas, of course, it's not the only thing that's been affected. US President Joe Biden was recently in the Middle East seeking a boost in oil production by the OPEC Plus. And that being said, what are your prospects with regard to oil supply and demand in the latter half of mm -hmm. this year? It's not easy to uh, make a forecast, it, but uh, many experts uh, forecast that the oil demand, um, well, uh, the uh, uh, increase, I mean, uh, return to at the health, I mean, reach to the health level um, in the second half of this year. That means that uh, the uh, demand uh, would reach to the uh, level. Uh, above the uh, pre-pandemic in 2019, which means that the uh, uh, oil production uh, may be slightly increased uh, because of the, uh, uh, the Iranian and Russians' invasion to Ukraine, the, uh, uh, the oil pro output and uh, in the output of oil production um, made by the uh, Russia has been reduced. But the sale uh, oil, uh, the production uh, increased by the United States. And then also oil OPEC countries slightly increased their uh, the production, I mean, oil production volume, not very much. Uh, but so I think the, as a whole, the demands and supply of the uh, oil uh, is uh, forecast, I mean, is forecasted to increase very slightly. Uh, to meet the uh, slightly um, and, uh, healthy demand of the oil in the second half of this year, I think. Right, I see. Professor Harold, the Biden administration has been urging for a cap on the price of Russian crude oil. Now, there is a bit of debate over this particular cap, with some energy experts claiming it would serve to push prices up further. What are your thoughts? 
The aim to set politically a price for Russian oil significantly under the world market price could only work if all relevant consuming countries would strongly act together. Then it would be a take it or leave it decision for Russia, and maybe Russia would choose to take it. And even then, the consuming countries would have to decide who gets how much of the discounted oil. But if we look to the current situation in the world, it seems quite unlikely that all consuming countries will act together. And so Russia could sell its oil to countries that are willing to pay more than the price cap, but less than the regular world market price. Nevertheless, a price cap or a similar instrument could have a price damping effect on crude oil markets insofar as such an instrument would signal that um, the US and its allies are willing to accept also in future Russian oil as part of the world market. Right, and speaking about support for that, Professor Shin, mm -hmm. Finance Minister Chu Kyung Ho has alleged, has pledged that is, Seoul's mm -hmm. uh, support of US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's proposal for a, pri a cap that is on Russian crude oil. How does this support, do you think, look to affect Korea's future energy imports from Russia? Mm -hmm. Well, we have to wait for a while, but I think the uh, impact could be quite limited uh, because, first of all, as you know very well, last June, G7 member countries, I mean, G7 leaders uh, reached to a broad agreement uh, 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 to uh, 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 seek ways to uh, uh, reduce the, um, uh, I mean, impose a price cap on the uh, Russian oil. Uh, but they do work further uh, on the uh, technical options of how uh, of how they uh, how to deliberate. I mean that they just agreed to uh, decide they impose the uh, price cap on the uh, Russian oil, but still many things to remain to uh, realize as a policy, effective policy, I think. And the objectives of this uh, the agreement was to reduce the uh, Russian revenues from export. I mean oil exports. But the I uh, think as I said before, we have to wait for a while uh, until we see the uh, the policy as a real policy. You know. Second one is, you know, uh, the out of total, uh, the uh, imported oil, we got, I mean, we only import 5% from Russia. It's a very uh, small amount. Um, so uh, considering time to see the realization of the policy agreed by G7 leaders and then the uh, portion contribution of the, I mean, uh, the, the imported amount, percentages of the uh, imported oil from Russia to Korean economy is quite small, relatively small. So we have to wait, even though the Russian government uh, clearly said that if any country joined to the price cap campaign, they will take some revenge action. But I think that we have to wait and see because that during the uh, the time we, while we wait for something happen, uh, there are many things could be changed. So right. we have to wait. There are very many variables, of mm. course. Mm -hmm. Professor Harold, how does the globe's present energy crisis compare to that of the 1970s, do you think? The 1970s saw so two oil crises with uh, prices that are not so different in today's money from the prices we have seen recently in the oil market. The real new situation is the term oil in the gas market, which is concentrated in some regions because the gas market is only partly a global market. Russian gas that is not delivered to Europe is gas that does not reach any market as the relevant Russian pipelines only go to the West. However, this missing gas only makes itself felt in parts of the world as not all gas markets are fully interconnected. Gas price, prices in Asia and Europe are highly correlated as both countries consume LNG. The US, on the other hand, is an LNG exporter with only limited export capacity, which is not enough to align prices. Gas prices there are much lower. So we have different economic concerns in different parts of the world. The US is concerned about high prices following sanctions on Russian oil, which is a concern about absolute price levels that could anger voters. Europe and Asia are also very concerned about absolute prices but also very much about relative prices. How much more do their companies have to pay for natural gas compared to US competitors? Mm -hmm.
Right, a very valid point right there. Meanwhile, Professor Shin, how should South Korea seek to navigate the current climate of energy challenges? Well, it is a fact that we don't have many options at the moment, but uh, uh, we have to make, I mean, make efforts to uh, reduce the energy consumption on the short-term basis. And another one, I want to emphasize that, you know, European Union member countries want to uh, diversify as the uh, source of the imports of the uh, oil and natural gases, mainly uh, the Western African countries like Nigeria and then the uh, Senegal, Angola and those countries. And we have also uh, effort, make efforts to diversify the sources of energy I mean, importing countries. On the long-term basis, uh, I mean, the government has empathized already, but we have to develop, I mean, the, uh, uh, I mean shift our energy policy to from physic, uh, fossil the energy uh, to the uh, green energy, also renewable energy sources. I mean, that will be the one of the uh, a few remaining uh, solutions to overcome the energy crisis. Right, and we'll keep our fingers crossed for that, of course. Professor Harold, how is Germany working to overcome its plight with regard to energy amid the current heat wave and also, of course, ahead of the upcoming winter season? At the moment, the German government is trying to prepare for the next winter and at the same time to set the course for additional infrastructure in LNG and uh, in renewable energies. In the short term, Germany is trying to replenish its rather extensive natural gas storage facilities over the summer. Then the German government wants to ensure that the gas market continues to function. In addition to financial aid for some energy companies, this means government control of uh, German Gazprom subsidiaries. A big issue, of course, is to use less natural gas. Um, Coal-fired power plants are to be allowed to operate longer. Public buildings are to be heated only at lower temperatures. Mm. Citizens are also being asked to reduce their heating needs. And um, in the event of a real shortage, plans are being drawn up for which industrial consumers should be shut down first. Yes, the winter could be tough, and um, in the worst case, it would cost a few percentage points of GDP. But there will be no economic collapse, and unlike in Ukraine, it is not a matter of life and death. Right, of course, hopefully not. Professor Shin, you spoke mm. about the importance of focusing on green alternatives for, the, uh, for South Korea, that mm. is. What are your thoughts with regard to the new UN administration's efforts to focus on nuclear power energy? I think the UN administration recognized the importance of the uh, uh, so-called future energy sources. So um, I think uh, the, uh, the direction is very clear. Uh, and the, uh, but the uh, depending on the uh, the administrations. I mean, before I mean, between the previous administration led by President Moon and then the current uh, the administration led by Yoon, there must be some differences in terms of the energy uh, policy. So I think uh, uh, through the uh, our, the uh, several times of the discussion or meetings, whatever, with the experts. Uh, I think uh, they can reduce the gap between two administrations, which means that to reflect the, uh, the expert opinions or reflecting the, uh, the uh, changes happening in the world, I think uh, the government could uh, the, take the right direction in their energy policy. And based on this, the uh, co cooperative uh, the relations and the uh, situations, the government, if, if they prepare the policy and impl try to implement the policy, they, we will uh, the make maximize the effects in our energy policy, I think. Right, and staying with the same issue, Professor Harold, what can you tell us about a nuclear power energy over in Germany? Well, there is a huge debate whether to um, use the uh, three last uh, reactors that are still running for a longer time. And um, while well, it's politically a, a very difficult uh, situation um, because part of the parties that form our uh, government coalition um, don't like it, others uh, would uh, use um, that measurement. Um, at the moment, um, the debate is a little bit shifting um, to, to use nu nuclear power, power because we have to use um, 
every measure that is available um, to reduce um, our, um, yeah, our, our demand for Russian gas. Right, which is completely understood, of course. All right, Professor Harold over there in Germany, thank you very much for joining us live at this very early eye to end with your thoughts. And Professor Shin here in the studio, thank you very much for your insights. My pleasure. Welcome. The southern resort island of Jeju-do is emerging as a popular vacation destination, that is. Now, for more on what that means, I turn to my colleague Ireyan to take a look. 38-year-old Yu min is staying on Jeju Island for a month to enjoy a peaceful time with his family in a small and quiet village. But he cannot put his job as an office worker aside. I'm here on workation for the first time as a reward for my accomplishments in the first half of this year. My colleagues who have been on workation said it was quite refreshing. Combining the words work and vacation, this new trend allows workers to take a break from their usual place of work, but not the work itself. And one of the most popular domestic workation spots these days is Jeju Island. According to a survey conducted by one of the biggest job searching websites, Jeju Island was selected as the most popular workation location for office workers, accounting for over 76 percent of responses. There are even co-working spaces here too. This is one of the open space offices designed for people who come Jeju for a so-called workation. People can enjoy beautiful natural scenery while doing their work in a quiet space and demand for these spaces is seeing a dramatic rise. The space provides not only a quiet workspace, but also offers other conveniences for workers. One shared office space owner says she's seeing a high reservation rate these days. When I first opened this place three years ago, the idea of a workation was unfamiliar to many people. But since the outbreak of COVID-19, more and more people are visiting open working spaces on Jeju. Workers used to have to take time off to enjoy nature on Jeju, but now they can enjoy it after work. And this is becoming an opportunity for Jeju to boost tourism on the island. Jeju Tourism Organization is working to develop tourism in local counties by rolling out workation programs based on local accommodation, activities and food. This is the one and only tour program that can be enjoyed only in Jeju's local villages, which will lead to local economic growth. She added the organization also plans to run its own open spaces for workers next month to meet rising needs, while cooperating further with private companies to encourage more workations to Jeju Island. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News, Jeju. Food is a fundamental part of culture, and with these words of wisdom in mind, my colleague Choi min Jong took to the streets of Seoul and beyond to explore the true taste of Korea, if you will, to take another look. What's the first food that pops into your mind when thinking about Korea? Tteokbokki or kimbap? Well, these are South Korea's most loved soul food, but you have to know that there is so much more to taste when you visit Korea. When searching for world-class restaurants, many food lovers consult guidebooks like the famous Michelin Guide. In South Korea, one of the most popular guidebooks is the Blue Ribbon Survey. The guidebook was first introduced in 2005 and is used by Koreans to distinguish good restaurants and cafes. Based on objective evaluations from both the general public and food critics, restaurants and cafes are given up to three ribbons. And the more ribbons, the better the restaurant. The biggest difference the Blue Ribbon Survey has compared to foreign guidebooks is that it respects and incorporates what Koreans enjoy eating. One of the other platforms Koreans often use is Mango Plate. It's a location-based restaurant discovery service for people in Korea, similar to Yelp in the U.S. Like the Blue Ribbon Survey, it's a rating system run by the masses. Uh, the ratings themselves are what sets Mango Plate apart from a lot of the other services out there. It's, like I said, for the people, kind of people. When it comes to Korean food, many people think of Korean barbecue. 
This restaurant is one of the hottest barbecue restaurants in Seoul, loved by locals. It has two blue ribbons and is highly rated on mango plate thanks to its famous large beef ribs. Our restaurant is famous for its straw grilled meat. When we made this restaurant, we wanted our customers to feel all five senses and we decided to focus on scent in particular. We tried hard to come up with a unique scent and taste. It has a very smoky aroma and it's also very visually pleasing because it's cooked on a traditional Korean pot lid. It's really, really good. The juice really pops in your mouth. It's already been marinated, so it's perfectly seasoned. But I think it's going to be even better with all these beautiful side dishes. The main ingredients for the side dishes, like pickles and kimchi, frequently change depending on which ingredients are in season. You can't miss out on rice when you're having Korean food. I'm going to wrap up this meal with some bokkeumbap, or fried rice. And this cold noodle, naengmyeon. We waited for 3 hours and 40 minutes. We came here out of curiosity because many people say it's such a good place. Now that I've tried the food, I can understand why. It's very tasty. We waited for 3 hours. This place was popular even 2 years ago, so we thought we wouldn't have to wait for too long, but there are still a lot of people waiting. Despite the overflowing number of customers, the restaurant owner is not interested in increasing the number of restaurants here in Korea, but instead plans to expand his Korean barbecue overseas. There is a uniqueness when there is only one restaurant standing. If there are the same restaurants here and there, I think the brand value disappears. But we are planning to open this restaurant in the U.S. next year. And what's next? Let me show you some next-level Korean food. This restaurant here is famous for its hanshik omakase coarse meal, which is the combination of hanshik, which means Korean food, and omakase, a Japanese dining style where the chef chooses the meal for you. The traditional omakase is based on sushi, but Mango Plate says Korea has begun to see many new types of omakase using ingredients ranging from Korean beef to gnocchi. For two hours, from the first course until the very end, People can comfortably enjoy food that goes well with alcohol. We change our menu every three months based on which ingredients are in season. Normally, we would just have the tofu and the kimchi in Korea, but as you can see with all the cheese and the ragu sauce, it's a very good combination of Western and Korean cuisine. The Korean pork dakgalbi burger is the restaurant's most popular dish. My favorite is the dakgalbi burger. Usually, dakgalbi is made with beef, but it's definitely more flavorful because it's made with Korean pork. The cheese and the bread coated with meat juice also gives a smooth texture. Wow. This is definitely no ordinary hamburger. Besides these dishes, the meal also includes a protein dish, a seafood dish, rice, and a traditional Korean dessert. I'm so full right now. I'm going to finish my wonderful dinner with some cheers. Tan! Before the pandemic, people used to enjoy quality food at an affordable price. But now, more people value the experience that comes with eating good food, so there's a growing trend in the premium sector. More and more people are visiting South Korea's most popular tourist destination, Jeju Island, and many of them are here for the food. From black pork barbecue to fresh seafood and citrus fruits, there's so much to enjoy. We recommend that foreigners visit Jeju Island. The island became very popular during the pandemic as people couldn't fly abroad. Jeju is a great place to visit during spring, summer, autumn and winter. It would be great for people to enjoy food that's popular each season. 
Gosari yukke jang is a traditional Jeju dish. Families used to make the dish using an entire pig for events like weddings or national holidays. Everything is done by hand from making the pork broth to ripping the meat and ferns. We use buckwheat flour to give it a thick texture. Gosari, a type of fern, is rarely eaten globally, but young sprouts thoroughly boiled in water are used to make soup and side dishes in Korea. Jeju is particularly well known for gosari as the island's conditions are ideal for the plant to grow. I'm gonna try the gosari yukgejang. It's very thick. I think it's a very good way to start off my day. It's very flavorful. How do you like it? It tastes really good, man. Really? Is it a familiar taste? Yeah. It's kind of like, um, kind of like the uh, meat soup I get in my country. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> it tastes, tastes really good. Would you recommend this to your friends outside? Absolutely. I mean, what's the name of the restaurant? <laughs> I'm in front of this beautiful Jeju beach and right next to the beach, people can enjoy some fresh seafood. In Jeju, there are restaurants by the sea that sell fresh seafood caught by female divers, or henya. These women, some in their 80s, dive in the sea to collect shellfish and other seafood. Well, just the divers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's gorgeous. You know, I mean, spectacular, but I mean, having these ladies go out there and uh, do the diving thing. Yeah. Everyone seems to enjoy it a lot, so it's really nice. And like, when we go around the zoo, we see people uh, at the beach, like uh, not fishing, but taking seafood, and it's great. Some people may not feel so comfortable with eating raw fish, as it can easily cause food poisoning. But an expert says it's safe as long as it's cleaned properly. Raw fish that is caught during the peak season will likely have more flesh and taste better. But people have to keep a close watch on whether the seafood is cleaned using clean water. The food ministry is doing well on managing such requirements, so I think Korea has a good reputation for raw food among foreigners. Another go-to spot is this cafe that sells top-notch coffee using tangerines grown on Jeju. This cafe has two blue ribbons and is run by the winner of the 2016 Korea National Barista Championship. Our signature coffees are the tangerine cappuccino, iced tangerine latte and yuzu americano. They are all speciality coffees that go really well with the flavor and aroma of citrus fruits. Our cafe is on a 40-year-old tangerine orchard and when it's winter we use Jeju tangerines to make the coffee. Now that I've had my coffee, I'm full and feeling good. All the food that I've shown you, though, is just the tip of the iceberg. We hope you can see that the cuisine is something you've got to make the most of if you're planning to visit South Korea. Che Min Jung, Arirang News, Jeju. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Greece, wildfires are tearing through parts of the country. Hundreds of residents and tourists on the Greek island of Lesbos have been evacuated as wildfires threaten to engulf local villages. Some 50 local firefighters, 17 fire trucks and firefighting aircraft are being helped by volunteers to tackle the blaze. Since the fire started on Saturday, more than 450 people were evacuated to other parts of the island. The fires have reportedly damaged at least 26 buildings so far. Meanwhile, a four-day wildfire in the Greek mainland's Dadia forest is threatening a black vulture habitat, while residents have been forced to flee. The wildfires come as Europe endures a heat wave that has also sparked major fires in France and Italy. A volcano on Japan's southwestern island of Kyushu has erupted. Japan's meteorological agency has reported that the Sakurajima volcano erupted at 8.05 p.m. Sunday local time, sending plumes of smoke and rocks into the sky. The agency declared a level 5 alert, its highest level, for only the second time since 2015. Local residents have been forced to evacuate, but so far there have been no reports of damage or casualties. Sakurajima is known as one of Japan's most active volcanoes. 
Pope Francis is in Canada to apologize to indigenous peoples for abuses by Catholic missionaries. Landing in Canada on Sunday, the Pope is expected to make the apology on behalf of the Catholic Church. The Church oversaw more than 80 federally mandated residential schools that forcibly assimilated indigenous children into mainstream Canadian culture. From the 1800s until 1997, over 150,000 indigenous children attended the institutions and many faced abuse. Pope Francis has called the trip a, quote, penitential pilgrimage and is set to visit a former residential school on Monday. And finally, Comic-Con is back in person for the first time since 2019. The comic book convention in San Diego saw tens of thousands of fans dressing up in cosplay as characters from television, film and video games. The event, which runs from July 21 to 24, also featured live panels, celebrity attendances and all the latest announcements on movies and TV shows. Matthew Ashley, Adidas News. Good Monday afternoon. Now that the rain has tapered off, the country is set to roast in ferocious heat. Sun reaching 33 degrees and that is 5 degrees higher than yesterday. And the feels like temperatures are much hotter due to high humidity. Please wear cool and loose fitting clothes if you have to be outside today. And those of you in Gangwon-do, Chungcheongbuk-do and Gyeongsang-nam-do provinces might need an umbrella as 5 to 40 millimeters of shower are expected with stormy conditions possible. And heat alerts are dominant and there are even heat warnings in parts of Gyeongsang-buk-do province. It's obviously downright hot with highs exceeding 30 degrees in most regions. And also factor in the UV index which can be very high in many regions. So please avoid strenuous outdoor activities if possible. Well, scorching heat should continue for the rest of the week, hovering around 33 degrees. And tomorrow, scatter showers for inland regions are expected. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. And those are the headlines at this hour. Do stay tuned to Adidas News for more on the day's top stories. Thank you for now.